So I arrived in RISD in 82 and joined the industrial design department and loved it. Uh, the process that they taught at the time and probably still do um, is just tremendous because it's so much about invention, idea generation, use of hands, how to develop all different kinds of skills in the machine shop and the plastics. And the issue that I'll, I'll bring back to you in a minute about where need, where is need in the fine arts because it's a very, very difficult thing to sort of put your finger on. Uh, there's personal need, but when you, when you ask yourself as an artist, I want to be an entrepreneur and I want to run a successful business, the first question is, well, what's the need? And you can kind of stop right there. It's like, I just need to make stuff. Uh, so it's a personal need. Uh, and, if you, and I think that most uh, studio artists, when they go into the studio, they come from that sort of, I'm just exploring my own world, and I'm, I'm doing it for my own reasons. If I make something, it's because I care about it. If you like it, that's just good luck. And so that's nice. Um, that's why I think income for artists is pretty random. Uh, versus if you, and I'm kind of trying to puzzle this thing through, is if you try and take this idea of need uh, in this more abstract sense, um, and how do you define that in a way that you can address need uh, in people? Um, so as a sculptor and an artist, it's, it's a very abstract place that you go to. And I've sort of morphed through the years. It's been as much a process of elimination and exploration in terms of how to bring the dollars in. So in the beginning it was freelance, rendering, model making. Then it was furnishings, metal furnishings, uh, ICFF, 89 and 90. Uh, Dee would go to the craft shows with a box about this big, and it would be worth about forty, fifty thousand dollars 50000 I'd have to rent a very big van that's worth half that. And half of it would sell, and half of it wouldn't. And I looked at the and I said, yeah, you've got something going on with this. Uh, <laughs> small's not so bad. So I, uh, I decided, and it, it did begin with the Dynobite, uh, this little bottle opener in 1989. Uh, it's a little functional bottle opener. And I decided to change the business from large furnishings to small little products. And in that case, it was because in the craft market, I recognized, I asked, what do the galleries need? And I sort of realized that they're the buyers. They come and they buy at the craft shows and the wholesale days. That they needed a nice little gift under 100 bucks. Under 50 is even better. And so I just came up with the little dynamite. I decided to make small things, use a cottage industry model, use all the different jewelry suppliers in, in Rhode Island, and developed what turned into be a line of about 65 products. And quite a few more of that if you added all the color variations. So we had soap dishes, all the tabletop stuff, letter openers, bottle openers, uh, picture frames using epoxy resin, spin cast, uh, gravity fed, all different kinds of stuff. Uh, and that was about a 10 year preoccupation. The whole time I've been running along parallel with that was with making sculpture. So commission by commission and then the, and then the production work. So I, I build stuff and I like to build stuff. My, my sort of fascination starts uh, with how stuff goes together. So I'll sort of come up with some basic ideas, like if you take little rectangles of metal and you connect them edge by edge with a spot weld, you can make what begins to be curvature out of flat platelets. So what I found is that I could build compound curvatures with little pieces of metal, almost no wasting material, uh, with very easy technique. One hand is a welder, one hand is a little metal plate, bucket plates, just start welding. The, um, so the context that I'm working in is site-specific uh, sculpture of sort of the process of elimination, furnishings, tabletop, freelance, all the rest of the stuff has brought me to site-specific and it, it needs me sort of, it's the perfect match because what I love about it is you, well in contrast to production and the, the gift collection, you come up with your fun new ideas and then you really just need to run the business. You've got to do the trade shows, you've got to work on the manufacturing and production and it very quickly becomes a sort of cycle and you just have to keep feeding the beast and going back to the trade shows and having the new ideas. That wore me out after a while. What I love about the site-specific work is you have a new site, a new group of people, a new reason to sort of justify the work, and it all happens in six months to a year. So you go from the very ephemeral to the very delivered in that amount of time. And it, the, the projects that I've done recently have ranged from uh, an ark and a yard site memorial for a Jewish temple, the, the temple Beth Elohim in Wellesley, Mass. I'm a Catholic kid, I knew nothing about the tra their traditions, and so it was a pretty interesting process, and it became a very significant formal part of their synagogue. It's, it's the front and center. And that was one of those examples where the artistic side of what I do 
is quite different from, the, it blends in with the design side. So that's where, I, I use these two terms, um, spatial awareness, and that's when you go into a site, and you almost have to turn off your brain and just listen with your eyes. That's the phrase that I, it's like, just take it in and look at it from all the vantage points, sort of be aware of what's the architecture doing, what's the sight lines doing, what are the values of the people, what is the back sort of social contextual stuff. And then the ideas start to sort of come in, you know, and then there's a, then it's traditional design stuff. It's sketches and drawings and sketches and drawings and models, conversations, refinements, material experimentation, and then finally the build part. And then the build part, I'm really a design build company, is as challenging as the design development part. We have to build them. And so, and I still build them myself by hand with one assistant. And this, the evolution step to hire the real art fabricators is purely budget driven. So it has to be a big enough number that I can hire the other guys and still be paid. So right now, I'm essentially paid through the labor hours of building the work. And the design part is how I get, get the work. This one I just completed for the Lakewood Public Library. It is, in fact, 15 feet tall, so everybody's guessed what whatever 15 is. It's probably up to the lights anyway, beyond that. I think it's in any case, in this case, it was up against a big uh, facade, and I, I, I sort of looked at where I wanted to be able to see through the form before I knew what the form was. I, I saw how it wanted to have sort of a frontal orientation to the building. But I like this idea of the two metaphors. This is for Lakewood outside of Cleveland where they're kind of the old Rust Belt sort of stuff. You know, these are, this is a community that's trying to feel good about itself, trying to come back up, somehow feel good about the neighborhood, and they love their library. These are the most appreciative people, I can tell you. Um, so the two theories, or sort of mixed, mixed metaphors, this is vaguely a water droplet, sort of the scene in the side view. Or if you look at just between this point and the curvature down and around, there's sort of an implied water droplet. And then, then it's sort of this sprout. So it's sort of like the watering and then the first young sprout. And what happens is you drive down Detroit Avenue, you get what I was calling a, a sort of fixed, a fixed location animation effect, where it seems to open and close sort of as you pass by the piece. And, um, and so there was a scale, there was sort of water reference, wave reference, sort of wings, there's sort of this idea of showing sort of intelligence. They said we want something that sort of speaks to intelligence, we don't want a pile of books and letters in the front of it. They liked the idea that it felt very organic, but that it also looks like it was incomplete, like it was still being made. Uh, so they liked that idea that education and knowledge is an ongoing sort of story. Um, and what was a nice spin-off, yeah, the, the, I just got this in the mail, thank you. And this, this, is, this is how positive these people are, it was incredible. I, they kept sending me like, oh look, it's in the, in the cover of the paper, and it's in the, the city's adopted on their imagery. So they've got this, it says, Poems and Problems, uh, inspired by Peter Dickenbrock's Transversion, which is the, the title of the piece. So they, the high school teacher asked the high school kids to do eight pre-calculus and eight post-calculus problems based on the sculpture. <laughs> and they're funny, they're like, uh, someone in the neighborhood doesn't like the color of the sculpture, they want to paint it purple. So they need to you know, define the square footage surface area to figure out how many ounces of purple paint is required to paint. Uh, you want to, you're a golfer and you want to hit a golf ball through the top rung, and you are 175.3 feet from the base of the sculpture, what angle of trajectory force do you know? I'm like, too funny. Then, uh, and then they had a, a poetry contest, so they, they invited all the, neighbor, all the people in the, in the town to write poems, and it was like, a, Pretty great example, I guess, of where, like, how does public art reach the community?